Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to PerfWeb 83, day three. And clearly, I'm not Tammy Sparacino, so Tammy is uh, still not here yet and ready to move on with the Journal Club. So I am going to be sitting in for Tammy. Uh, go through our quick housekeeping notes. Contact us at uh, contact at perfusioneducation.com. Of course, we have our call-in number uh, if you would like to call in and be uh, live on the air, and I'm going to read that to you. It's 832-239-5358. That's 832-239-5358 to be live on the air. Have a conversation with me. Uh, check out our scroll bar that goes on through the entirety of the show. Uh, it has all of our social media addresses and our call-in number, which scrolls across the screen continuously through the program. Check out our MediWeb app. You can go to the Google Play or Apple iTunes store, Apple, uh, the, uh, the App Store, and you can find our uh, application there. <coughs> Excuse me, for, please forgive me, Critical Care Application for Perfusionists. It's got some great features, and we continuously are doing updates on that. Only $2.99, need to sell a million of them, tell you all that all the time, and then I can retire. PerfWeb Podcast, go to your favorite streaming software and look up PerfWeb. You can uh, listen to our programs. Our programs are also being streamed live on those same podcast uh, 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 platforms. So you can listen to it while you're driving, while it's going on live. You can listen to it later in our recorded uh, podcast programs. So with all of that said, please make sure on these social media platforms to like and share and, and make comments because all of that really helps us with Google moving us up the rankings. Um, we're growing in popularity on YouTube, but I'd like to grow some more. So please have your colleagues, if you will, uh, sign up and start subscribing and make some comments on our videos. It would be most appreciated by us. So again, I'm sitting in for Tammy Sparacino. Uh, she is extremely busy. She apologizes once again, though I'm disappointed because I miss her tremendously. And uh, But uh, I'm going to sit in for her and see if I can do a good job, okay? So uh, we're going to move right into Journal Club. And of course, I'm your host, Joe Basha, and I'm going to be the presenter today for this. The article that we're going to be reviewing was written by Dr. Ashish Shah, who is the Professor of Cardiac Surgery, Surgical Director, Heart Transplant Program, and Alfred Blaylock, Endowed Director and Chair, Department of Cardiac Surgery at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. His uh, article is an invited expert opinion on a perspective based on the following article. And I'm going to show you that article first. So Dr. Shaw's central message, and this was published, by the way, in the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery very recently, July of 2022. His central message is that NRP adds another tool, powerful tool, for organ recovery. However, it will further complicate an already imperfect process. And we're talking about transplants here, finding organs for transplants. Some terms that you're going to hear in today's presentation are ACP, which is the American College of Physicians, CDCD, which is Controlled Heart Donation After Circulatory Determination of Death, also known as DCD, which is Donation After Cardiac Death. NRP, which is normothermic regional perfusion, NMP, normothermic mechanical perfusion, OCS, organ care system, CSS, cold static storage, DPP, direct procurement protocol, and DBD, donation after determination of brain death. And what you see down there in the right corner, lower right corner, is a picture of a cooler. You know, when patient is going to be a uh, donor for a heart transplant, 
the various teams arrive for uh, different organs, depending on what the situation may be. And a sternotomy is performed and the heart is infused with a preservation fluid, cardioplegia, and then put uh, on ice in an ice chest and transported to the recipient. Uh, in the transmedics device, which you see on the bottom left, that is a normal thermic mechanical perfusion device. And that device, the heart is placed, it's heart in a box, the heart is placed in there and it pumps, continues to operate uh, with uh, a variety of, of fluids and medications and so forth. Uh, and it has some distinct advantages, which we're going to discuss based on the articles and some disadvantages, which we're gonna discuss again, based on the articles. It's also important to look through this uh, algorithm in the Journal of Thoracic Disease. And what you see, if we'll just follow it from this point here, and we're gonna follow the various different flow paths, you have a DCD heart donor referral criteria. So this is a patient who is equal to or less than 50, normal cardiac investigations if available, and anticipated uh, uh, and I'm not sure what WIT stands for, so please forgive me of less than 30 minutes. And I believe that's uh, time before of withdrawal um, and then uh, 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 from life support. So I apologize for that. Then there's a withdrawal from life support. Uh, the patient is given perimortem heparin, so you anticoagulate them. There's a standoff period. There's a declaration of death. There's a transport and identification, a midline sternotomy. And then you go one of these two pathways. DPP, direct procurement protocol, where you remove the heart from the patient. Um, you prepare it. You cross clamp. You do the preservation flush. You use topical hypothermia and you explant, you have the explantation of the, of the heart. And in this particular case, you clamp the head vessels and neck arteries, you establish central ECMO, you flow five liters a minute, you try to keep your mean arterial pressure greater than 50, a temp equal to or greater than 35, and you use a variety of inotropy like dopamine and vasopressin for blood pressure uh, control and probably some squeeze. Then here you would put it on the back table and you would prepare it for the heart in the box. And then you would manage the NMP, normothermic machine perfusion. Or in this particular case, you would look at the heart and assess it for adequacy. If adequate, then you would explant it and you would still put it in the heart in the box or you could, of course, if it's inadequate, discard the organ, or you can hook it on the, uh, the box and you can say it's not recovering adequately, or it is adequate, and it goes on to the uh, commence recipient procedure. So you do the transplant. But at this stage, you can also explant it and do standard CSS, which is cold static storage. Matt yesterday from Vanderbilt told us about the UNOS uh, website, unos.org, U-N-O-S. And I looked at that and I found that as of July 31st of 2022, there were 2,329 heart donors. There were 2,265 transplants. And in August 21st of 2022, up to, I think it was yesterday, there were 3,391 patients on a wait list for a heart, and that number was increasing by about 40 per day. Within that time period, 127 of those patients died on the wait list, and 136 of the patients on the wait list had become too sick to transplant. So that would be somewhere around 263 patients of 
the 2,265 transplants or 2,329 available donors that did not get transplanted. That's roughly 10%. The article that Dr. Shaw had reviewed or made commentary about comes from the American College of Physicians. It's titled, Ethics Determination of Death and Organ Transplantation in Normal Thermic Regional Perfusion, or NRP, with controlled donation after circulatory determination of death, which is DCD. And this is American College of Physicians' Statement of Concern. It was approved by the Board of Regents on April 17th, 2021. And it goes on to its conclusions and recommendations, and we're gonna really dive into this. It is tragic when a patient dies awaiting a needed organ, but organ procurement and transplantation must safely, must satisfy ethical standards in meeting this need. NRPDCD raises profound ethical questions regarding the dead donor rule. Fundamental ethical obligations of respect, beneficence, and justice, and the categorical imperative to never use one individual merely as a means to serve the ends of another no matter how noble or good those ends may be. The questions and concerns raised here have not been adequately considered to date. Further professional and public discussion of NRPDCD, a protocol more accurately described as organ retrieval after cardiopulmonary arrest and the induction of brain death is needed. ACP, American College of Physicians, recommends the use of NRP and DCD be paused. They are recommending that there be a cessation, temporarily perhaps, but paused, of this procedure, NRP. The burden of proof regarding the ethical and legal propriety of this practice has not been met, according to the ACP. Sound ethical arguments, not just assertions, must underpin organ procurement methods and such efforts must be consistent with U.S. legal and ethical standards for determination of death. Without this, we risk public, decreasing public confidence in healthcare and undermining support for organ donation further exacerbating the problem this protocol seeks to address. Based on the ACP's article, they have ethical questions and concerns, which are, first, even though the goal of improving the number and quality of, proceed, of procured organs is an important one here, the procedures and the operative definition used to determine death seem orchestrated to serve that end. NRPDCD appears to violate one of the ethical foundations of organ donation, the dead donor rule. The dead donor rule specifies that donors cannot be made dead in order to obtain their organs and that organ retrieval cannot cause death. It promotes trust in organ transplantation and in medicine more generally by assuring patients, families, and the public that medicine will center on the individual patient's best interests and not just the possible benefit to others, even if the need is great. And it is great. You saw the data from UNOS. In NRPDCD, the patient is declared dead by the circulatory definition, which requires that cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions be irreversible or permanent. And they have a caveat later on that they'll talk about irreversibility and permanence and how they interpret that. So keep that in mind. The intent however, is to reinitiate circulation and the patient is 
in fact, successfully resuscitated. The question arises, does this violate the requirements of declaring death by circulatory criteria? Then, after declaring circulatory death, the cerebral circulation is deliberately occluded. This renders the patient brain dead so that circulation can be restored and the patient still be considered dead now by brain death, not circulatory death criteria. Death has not taken its natural course. Brain death has been caused in order to prevent brain reperfusion when circulation is restored. The purpose seems to be justify, seems to justify, excuse me, reversing what was supposed to be irreversible circulatory death. Statements offered in support of NRP DCD should be scrutinized. For example, although some describe preventing cerebral circulation as ensuring natural progression to complete cessation of brain uh, function, Calling this a natural sequence is puzzling. NRPDCD requires a deliberate act intended to prevent the potential for brain recovery function after reperfusion and the reversal of circulatory determination of death. The fact that mechanical failure of occlusive devices is possible, meaning the clamp could come off or leak, motivating proposals to include safeguards that monitor for and ensure a lack of cerebral perfusion actually underscores the ethical significance of cerebral perfusion. Similarly, the possibility that reperfusion of the brain, were it not actively prevented, would be unlikely to restore consciousness or what some call meaningful neurologic function is not ethically relevant according to them. Although the criteria for determining brain death vary internationally, the US definition of brain death requires the loss of all brain functions. So this is a very deep ethical dilemma. You take a patient you, they are not brain dead, but they are, for all intents and purposes, uh, vent dependent and unable to survive without some type of, of mechanical, external mechanical uh, uh, support. You withdraw that support and you wait. They become hypoxic, they become hypotensive, they die you have it, their heart stops. This can take anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour. You then, and possibly longer, you then have a standoff period of five to 10 minutes. At the end of the understood standoff period or the, whatever that protocol is and for that institution or that state or that team, whatever the case may be, a sternotomy is rapidly done Cannula is placed in the right atrium, sent over to a reservoir to drain the heart because now it's distended and full. Clamps are applied to the arch vessels, so the innominate and the left carotid, uh, uh, probably left subclavian combined. And now you've isolated the head. You put a cannula into the aorta. You start flowing and you reanimate, bring back to life the heart and all of the other end organs sans the head. So you have a patient who has all of the blood supply going to their brain stopped. It has been stopped for five minutes to 10 minutes once the heart stopped. Plus you had a somewhat of a period of agonal phase where the heart was still beating, but likely very inadequate for good cerebral perfusion, but the other organs are recoverable. Is the brain recoverable? The American College of Physicians is arguing that this is really not death because you're bringing the body back alive. The heart is still going to beat. With that said, 
even if the stated intent of NRP, DCD, is to preserve the organs, not to resuscitate the patient. If that's, even though that's not the intent, this obscures and cannot be separated from what actually happens. NRP does resuscitate the patient. The assertion that NRP DCD is acceptable because the donor is in the process of dying lacks persuasiveness to them. The assertion that the donor has already been declared legally dead by another definition is also unpersuasive because death had been declared does not mean that the declaration cannot be invalidated by subsequent acts. The ethical obligation to respect persons, including the dying and the dead, limit what can and should be done in organ retrieval. Is declaring a patient dead by irreversible circulatory criteria, then rendering the patient brain dead before restoring circulation honest, transparent, and respectful of patient autonomy and dignity. Second, ethical implications from the standpoint of justice must be examined. For example, even if DBD is still the most common method of donation, there are large numbers of drug overdose victims who have sustained irreversible and devastating hypoxic brain damage but who are not brain dead. They still have some underlying brain function. They may not have a meaningful existence, but then that's the, really the debate here. What is a meaningful existence? To whom? In fact, DCD appears to be more common among overdose death, overdose death donors when compared to other donors, such as trauma victims. Calls to expand DCD following drug overdoses could disproportionately affect an underserved and or stigmatized population already burdened by the nation's substance abuse epidemic. Does this fulfill the requirements of justice for an equitable distribution of benefits and burdens within society? A lot said there. Third, while, as for all organ donations, proposed safeguards for NRP DCD are important, they alone cannot address more fundamental ethical problems. Ensuring that trained organ procurement facilitators separate from the donor's care team or the potential transplant recipient's care team initiate discussion with a potential donor or donor's family is always critical as is informed consent. If patients or family members of both the donor and recipients are not made aware of the full details of what this protocol involves, this lack of transparency, transparency can damage trust in healthcare and clinical research. More importantly, informed consent by itself cannot confer uh, uh, ethical legitimacy, I'm sorry, cannot permit consent to supersede all other ethical considerations, just as patients should not receive medically contraindicated interventions on request and research subjects should not be exposed to inappropriate risk even with their consent. So let me go through that again. Standards of medical ethics do not permit consent to supersede all other ethical considerations, just as patients should not receive medically contraindicated interventions on request and research subjects should not be exposed to inappropriate risks, even with their consent. So what they're saying is that even consenting to this procedure, unless I guess they're arguing that they may not really understand exactly what this procedure entails and that they are saying that if they did completely understand it, it would potentially influence their decision. I think that's what they're saying here. But they're also saying that 
just because somebody consents to a crazy procedure that is likely going to harm them doesn't mean that doesn't that doesn't excuse or it doesn't uh, 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 stop the duty to do no harm, basically is what it's saying. Fourth, X situ 2 alternatives to in situ 2 NRP exists, including hypothermic and normal thermic organ reperfusion that can be achieved by machines outside the body, like the OCS device. Reperfusion devices can be applied after organs are produced via DCD without restarting the donor's circulation or intentionally occluding brain perfusion to render an individual brain dead. More research is needed on these devices. There is a large and ethically significant difference between perfusing an organ versus perfusing an individual. They go on, and I remember I had talked about irreversibility and permanent. We recognize that whether permanent is a better term than irreversible is a subject of debate. Irreversible, however, is the term standardly used in U.S. law and medicine. So basically what they're saying is that they are differentiating between taking a patient withdrawing the mechanical support, we'll say ventilator, allowing them to become hypoxic, bradycardic, hypotensive, and go through that agonal phase, having them expire, opening them up, removing the organ, which, by the way, requires the clamping, not directly of the head vessels, but the ascending aorta up by the innominate, um, removing the organ and then reanimating it on a machine, never restarting the patient's circulation. They're differentiating that that is acceptable ethically in their view, but it is unacceptable to allow the heart to stop, open the chest, clamp the head vessels, and then reanimate the heart in situ or still in the patient and they're differentiating one versus the other i'm just my own opinion on this position statement from the american college of physicians i don't see the difference i, I think the 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 wishes of the patient or the wishes of the family prior to the procedure being done uh, play a huge role in this, and uh, I I can't see where even if the clamp were to leak, that you would have um, awareness. It's uh, that patient. The, the question is, where's the seat of the soul? Is it in the heart, or is it in the brain, or is it in every cell in our body? Where where is it? If it's in the heart, well, it can't be in the heart because you transplant the heart to somebody else. Where's your soul go? Now you're stuck with somebody else's. Now you're having to cohabitate with somebody else's soul. If it's in the brain, which seems to make more sense to me, um, then it's your thoughts. It's your brain. It's what it's. It, this is who we are. Who we are is up here. Um, and 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 when we talk about the heart of a person, that's also up here. Um, the heart is, is an organ, just a muscle that pumps blood so that this, who we are, can live. That's my view, okay? So let's look at Dr. Shaw. We talked about this article, again, Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery, very recently written just a couple of months ago. Dr. Shaw goes on to say that almost every article, research document, or administrative manifesto in heart transplantation begins with the following statements or keywords. Donors are scarce, donors are limited, the donor pool has not improved, donor shortage, donor shortage limits total number of transplants. Moreover, the number of patients with heart failure who are potentially transplant candidates continues to increase. This notion that somehow dramatic increases in donors will meet the actual demand has quietly been stifled, and instead, alternative therapies are now the real focus of heart failure innovation. To hope for more, more donors means we're hoping for more very premature death 
that preserves the heart but kills the brain or 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 you know and it 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 really in most cases that's what we're referring to here right um but that's that's a horrible that's a horrible thought not on the part of dr shaw but you know the fact that that is really the reality here we have to hope for more brain dead patients to accommodate the need that we have with donors and you know well, let's move on. Nonetheless, heart transplantation remains an effective and life-saving therapy. It stands out as one of the great scientific achievements of the 20th century. Certainly, any improvements or novel ways to generate even a few more don donors merit serious consideration. The first 21st century strategy to increase the pool of potential organs has been the use of hepatitis C infected hearts. This is very interesting. Taking such hearts with a potentially lethal virus, knowing, knowingly transplanting the organ in a need pa recipient, in other words, a patient that doesn't have hepatitis C, and then treating them after infecting them has to date to date, has to date, has been exceptionally successful. That's amazing to me. But even the rise in drug overdose deaths, the actual increase in acceptable heart donors has been modest. Xenotransplantation is, in Dr. Shaw's words, well, xenotransplantation. The next more immediate frontier is in using hearts from donors who are not formally brain dead. And I have a quick article there that you can find from the Associated Press on a man who recently got a first uh, pig heart transplant, so a xenotransplant from porcine, um, and that patient died after two months. The, uh, the graft continued to, uh, to fail, and that patient did not survive that. Of course, we all remember baby Faye back in uh, the uh, uh, in, uh, 1990s that uh, I think it was the night, maybe the 80s, that was uh, the baboon heart transplant into the baby at Loma Linda, Dr. Uh, Dr. Leonard Bailey, uh, you know, God rest him. These terminally injured patients, Dr. Shaw goes on to say, fall into a terrible and unique form of purgatory where they do not meet criteria for brain death, have acceptable cardiac, hepatic, and renal function, and likely would persist unless ventilatory support is withdrawn. If a family wants to end the suffering but donate their organs for transplantation, a unique and complex process is required. Donation after cardiac death, DCD, has been a begrudgingly acceptable process around the world. For years now, DCD has provided viable livers, lungs, and kidneys. The clinical results have been reasonable and better than the alternative of discarding organs and death on the transplant wait list. The notion that a heart may be usable after a period of standstill and warm ischemia has thought unlikely until recently. The first modern report among pediatric DCD was certainly favorable. Machine perfusion and the Transmedics Organ Care System, OCS, ushered in the new era when DCD hearts could be recovered, reanimated, and then assessed ex vivo. So you remove the organ, put it on the device, you perfuse it, and then you can assess its function at that point in time. That system, however, significantly increases organ recovery costs, and access is currently limited to a few centers. It is complex. One alternative solution is to reanimate such hearts using cardiopulmonary bypass or modified extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, ECMO. This in situ reperfusion, reanimation, and recovery have distinct advantages to all the organs and one complex disadvantage, that being normothermic regional perfusion, NRP. I thought that was such a profound statement that he said, I want to say it one more time. This in situ reperfusion, reanimation, and recovery have distinct advantages to all the organs that are going to be explanted for transplant 
and one complex disadvantage, that being the procedure itself, NRP. Unlike conventional brain dead donors, DCD requires the donor to die first, and this involves essentially anticoagulation and terminal extubation. The ensuing hypercarbia and hypoxia lead to a cessation of cardiac activity. Once the systolic blood pressure, blood pressure is less than 50 millimeters of mercury, the donor enters an agonal phase and all the organs are subjected to warm ischemia. Once the heart stops, the patient is declared dead. Of note, agonal phases have also been defined by oxygen desaturation, but it is increasingly clear that oxygen saturation and blood pressure do not reflect similar degrees of warm ischemia. At Vanderbilt, we are less concerned about oxygen saturation and focused on blood pressure. Nonetheless, when the patient is declared dead and, depending on local regulations, a standoff period is observed, which can be from five to 10 minutes. At that point, the patient is considered irreversibly dead and organ recovery can begin. The acceptable limits of warm ischemia are currently unknown in humans. Current opinion based on preclinical work supports 30 minutes as a threshold after which irreversible injury may occur. Clinically, we have recovered hearts for as long as 60 minutes in this agonal phase with acceptable post-transplant function. Future work will need to focus on true limits as they relate to individual donors considering age, diabetes, hypertrophy, and so forth. Moreover, there is a fantastic opportunity to study potential therapeutics to either precondition hearts or rescue these hearts. So what he is saying is you can, based on their experience, um, you can be very hypoxic for a very long time and still have a blood pressure, especially if you're young, otherwise physically healthy individual and have recovered hearts as long as 60 minutes in that agonal phase which means you have that much time of warm ischemia because you're not getting sufficient oxygen distribution at the deep tissue level. In addition, he's saying that this is a great opportunity to perhaps give these patients something to precondition those organs prior to the terminal extubation as they go through that process of dying, which may help recovery of those organs better or possibly after this has occurred and you reanimate the organ giving certain medications that can help with that reanimation process so that those organs that are going into somebody else have a, uh, a, a, a greater longevity. The thoracic team then begins to rapidly perform, this is after the standoff period, a sternotomy pericardiotomy, clamping of the arch vessels, cannulation of the aorta and right atrium, and initiation of circulatory support. The bloodless fields allow this, allows this to occur faster than one might imagine. In our experience, this can be done in less than five minutes with two experienced and well-organized surgeons. The goal is to minimize the warm ischemic time to all the organs and safely initiate, initiate circulatory support. So after that standoff period, they wanna go very, very fast to get that patient back on circulation because at that point, every second is going to matter. Once the cannulas are secured, the donor may be reintubated if lungs are recovered. We place a venting cannula in the main pulmonary artery to protect the right ventricle and the period of resuscitation begins. The PA cannula obviates the need to reintubate and provides both decompression of the left ventricle and minimizes afterload to the right ventricle. This resuscitative period has no agreed upon strategy, although most centers use well-studied and benign free radical scavengers in their perfusates, such as steroids, mannitol, erythropoietin, and N-acetylcysteine. The reassessment of the heart may be done in a number of ways. The Papworth team, a leader in this field, have reported using PA catheters and serial cardiac output measures to assess the organ. 
In an effort to be mobile and adaptable to any environment, our approach at Vanderbilt has been more pragmatic. In our experience and in a young donor cohort, visual inspection and a brief period of vol volume loading off circulatory support have been sufficient. We look for obvious right ventricular dysfunction, bradycardia, malignant arrhythmias, and blood pressure development. We also limit the circulatory time to 50 to 60 minutes to minimize the potential inflammation related to CPB and bleeding. This is an early experience and we continue to work to better refine this process. Whether biomarkers or these hemodynamic assessments are predictive of early allograft dysfunction is unknown. Our own experience suggests that among young donors, the experienced eyeball tests works very well. And this is a video, and we'll go ahead and play the video. And what you see here, you see the heart beating. It seems very snappy. Um, you see the abdomen has been accessed uh, down below. The head is up this way, right? Uh, let me let that video end and get this. So the head is here. You can see here. The heart's here. The chest is here. The abdomen is here. And here you see a clamp, which is applied along the innominate. And this probably has the left. Uh, carotid and subclavian combined uh, to prevent anything, I guess, from going up the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, cerebral, any of the cerebral circulation. Um, and so uh, these clamps isolate the head. You have a venous clamp in the right atrium, and then you have a clamp in the aorta here. And again, you can see this heart, which had gone through that agonal phase, has be, been reanimated and is actually functioning uh, pretty well. Now they haven't loaded it, that's empty, but uh, I, they load it and see how it, uh, how it does. But yeah, so keep it out of the uh, vertebral. So all of the head vessels are completely isolated with these, uh, with these clamps that you see here. And that's what, uh, I just go back to this, this is what they're arguing is that if one of these clamps is leaking, you potentially could be perfusing up in the head. But the patient went through a five or 10 minute period warm of absolutely no blood flow um, to the brain. And uh, then that clamp, even if it were to leak, be very inadequate flow, not to mention there was a pre uh, death portion of agonal where the patient was hypoxic and very low blood pressure for an extended period of time. So very hard for me to believe that there would be any, any ability for that, uh, there to be much in the way of brain activity that would be meaningful. Would there be any brain activity? I don't, I can't answer that question, but what is, what kind of brain activity would that be? And are we talking about just minimal brain activity or are we talking about awareness and being alive i i it, i'm having it's ethically very challenging this is i told you it's going to be very provocative organ recovery then is done in the usual fashion with aortic cross clamping infusion of cold uh, crystalloid preservation cardioplegia and standard cardiectomy we have used del nido solution exclusively with satisfactory results but again future studies will need to determine the optimal preservation medium Control of the cerebral vessels is the cornerstone of the technique to respect the basic premise of death in this setting. There are multiple methods, and although some have argued for some form of cerebral monitoring to ensure a cessation of blood flow, clamping the arch vessels makes any clinically meaningful blood flow impossible. And I completely agree with Dr. Shaw on that point. We have encountered several pitfalls in our early experience. The first is difficulty with aortic cannulation in a depressurized aorta. We had three aortic dissections likely due to the placement of the cannula that rendered the heart recovery inadvisable. The abdominal organs, however, in those cases were successfully recovered. We have since added an endotracheal tube stylet in our aortic cannula and placed the tip well into the arch. 
We also take a moment to de-air the cannula because coronary air can delay the cardiac recovery. And make sure they're doing this all really fast. Most important, it is critical to have multiple conversations with the procuring teams and local organ procurement organizations. Having the patients die in an operating room, prepping ahead of time, and having the CPB lines up on the field before withdrawal all minimize ischemic time. Unfortunately, there are no agreed upon standards and teams need to communicate and adhere to the hospital and family wishes. Abdominal teams may not fully understand the implications of CPB and the great advantages to them. So again, it's critical to effectively communicate the process. So the abdominal teams, they wanna rush in and get their organs, the kidneys, the pancreas, the liver, and they wanna get it and go. But if they just wait, those organs benefit tremendously from this reanimation process as well. Now they can do their dissection and have it ready to go for when they take the heart out, but there has to be good coordination between the teams because they can obstruct the inferior vena cava and block the blood flow back to the heart, which makes then flowing for the perfusionist running the uh, mini bypass or ECMO circuit, uh, the, uh, the hybrid ECMO circuit with a reservoir, uh, very difficult and, and, and risky. And you can have something occur like massive air embolization to the organs, which could hurt the perfusion to those organs, certainly not to the brain. Dr. Shaw goes on to say that the advantages of DCD donors represent a new source of heart donors. Beyond the obvious increase in total donors, the absence of brain death may have both short-term, less early allograft dysfunction and long-term, less vasculopathy benefits. Time will tell, but our own short-term experience had less inotropy needs and post-operative ECMO. The circuit is mobile, and NRP does not require transporting donors to another hospital. We bring all of our NRP equipment, including disposables, portable blood gas analyzers, and the entire ECMO circuit with us to all the donor hospitals. Finally, compared with ex vivo machine perfusion, the costs are significantly less. So compared to OCS, the costs are significantly less. Finally, compared with ex vivo machine perfusion, uh, uh, the, because the period of warm ischemia is aborted by circulatory support, there are likely advantages to the abdominal organs, which he points out makes sense. As a result of NRP, the abdominal team can proceed with their dissection without time pressure. Moreover, the restoration of hyperoxygenated blood may minimize ischemic injury to the biliary system for those that are doing the liver transplant. Although there is an experience with using ECMO for abdominal only recovery, it relies on retrograde perfusion via the femoral arteries and aortic interruption via a left thoracotomy. Central cannulation may provide better perfusion of the abdominal organs and venous decompression. Finally, the overall costs are centered around the pump, oxygenator, and disposables. However, the necessary personnel are also more than a conventional recovery team. At Vanderbilt, we have two perfusionists, two surgeons, and one preservationist on every case. And that's going to be expensive. But the OCS machine, compared to the ECMO machine, is each one of those circuits for OCS is $50,000. For the ECMO, you have the machine, which you reuse, but the disposables for that, so same with the OCS, the disposables for that are $2,000. So there's a $48,000 difference between uh, the two. Now, OCS adds the ability to go farther than uh, if you do just cold static storage, but it doesn't solve all of the problems. Clinical results to date. NRP was pioneered in the United Kingdom and Europe with a landmark series from the Papworth Group. There are two relevant techniques as described by the series. The first is to use NRP and then recover the hearts using ex vivo perfusion. In this case, the Transmedics OCS. 
The other is to recover the heart conventionally using cold storage after a period of in situ resuscitation. That's NRP. Overall rates of primary graft dysfunction and ECMO use have been low. No studies have examined long-term outcomes or incidence of graft coronary vasculopathy. In a small study of brain-dead donors on the OCS, there were no significant differences in intimal thickening at one year. Along with hearts and lungs, attention to outcomes for abdominal organs is also relevant. Traditionally, DCD, liver, and kidneys have been associated with acceptable, although somewhat inferior, outcomes compared with donation after brain death, meaning death after uh, donation after cardiac death versus the patient's heart continues to beat, but they're considered brain dead, and you remove their organs in the operating room. Likely related to the period of warm ischemia, biliary complications remain higher among DCD organ recipients. NRP appears to improve outcomes compared with DCD. A series from Spain details the improvement. A total of 95 patients underwent NRP compared with 117 with standard DCD recovery. This is for liver transplants. Biliary complications were reduced from 31% in the standard group to 8% in the NRP group. Very significant. Machine perfusion versus normal thermic regional perfusion. A truly novel 21st century debate is emerging between ex vivo machine perfusion versus in situ NRP, OCS versus putting the patient on ECMO, clamping the head vessels. Machine perfusion allows for a less complex recovery, organ assessment, and portability. However, the costs are significant. Moreover, the absence of loading limited assessment tools, and secondary effects of ex vivo perfusion remain problematic. So you're still on an external machine keeping this heart, and there are inflammatory uh, uh, processes that continue to occur through that transport period. NRP adds significant complexities, both technically and emotionally, limits myocardial injury, potentially improves outcomes for extrathoracic organs, and is currently cheaper. When we develop potential therapeutic measures on both platforms, this debate will become even more complex, agonizing, but certainly interesting. There are limits of warm ischemia. How long can a human heart withstand warm ischemia if resuscitated and reanimated using extracorporeal circulation and unloading? Current thinking is focused on 30 minutes. However, when warm ischemic actually, warm, when warm ischemia actually begins is unclear. The agonal phase is defined by both oxygen saturations and blood pressure. However, in our experience, they, there may, they may not be synchronous and young donors may have incredibly low saturations for more than 30 minutes without any significant declines of blood pressure. Moreover, we really do not have any sense for actual ischemia at the tissue level. This matters because abdominal teams will abandon organs after 30 minutes and hospitals will abandon the entire process if the donor does not die after 90 minutes. Because the mortality in these cases is 100% and potentially beneficial organs will be discarded and incinerated, having a firm understanding of viability is critical. Because we do not put limits on these types of recoveries, predicting which donors will pass and those who will not is also an increasingly relevant question. So you may extubate them and they just don't die. Given the resources in both time, travel, and moral fortitude, developing reliable ways to predict this unique form of death is meaningful and important. In the existing literature, there are some data that support age, mechanism of injury, and residual reflexes. The disadvantage and rethinking our notion of death. Mostly dead is also slightly alive, is a memorable line in the movie The Princess Bride, but does, does frame the perspective on death and organ donation. The notion of benefiting from another person's expedited death was difficult enough. 
In the United States, this was detailed in the landmark case of Tucker v. Lauer. Although beyond the scope of this review, the details of this case are worth reading. Tucker v. Lauer essentially separated the notion of death and brain death, without which modern transplantation in the United States would be impossible. However, the details of the case illuminate the different perspectives on organ donation. Although the transplant community see all the good, those outside of the field see real conflicts of interest. Transplant teams benefit from the transplant process. More transplants, more money, more research, more television shows, more social media. On the other hand, organ donation is also predicated on the wishes of the donor to help others with their death. NRP adds another challenge. The dead donor rule is designed to protect people from being killed for their organs. So people have to be dead to donate. They have irreversible brain injury, brain death, or irreversible cessation of cardiac function. No circulation means death. NRP restores circulation and restarts the heart itself. The very notion of death for all recorded time is that your heart has stopped. NRP challenges this premise and then has recovery teams stopping the heart again to recover it for another person. Transplant professionals recognize that the alternative is that all of these organs would be discarded. So why not? In that uh, case that he talked about uh, uh, in regards to, uh, to uh, forgive me, Tucker and Lauer, the instructions of the judge to the jury in that case, and this is back in 1972, you, the judge talking to the jury, shall determine the time of death in this case by using the following definition of the nature of death. Now, what happened in this case was that this fella, had come in to the hospital, he had fallen, uh, and that would be Tucker. Tucker fell, hit his head. They wanted to take him to the hospital. He was at work, he didn't wanna go. He goes to the hospital eventually, and uh, he ends up uh, with a, a cerebral bleed, and uh, he died. He was brain dead. There was another guy I can't remember his name now, Kep, I think. He was a, a purchasing agent in the hospital. This happened at the Medical College of Virginia. And he happened to be in the hospital for heart failure, needing a heart transplant. So they looked for the family of Mr. Tucker, but they couldn't find them. So they determined him to be brain dead, took his heart and gave it to Kip. And that's how Kip got his surgery. Well, Kip's brother, the executor of his estate got pretty upset about this because nobody asked them if it was okay. And they brought this lawsuit. This is uh, 1972, 1975 era. And the judge in that case had to admonish the jury as to what they had to decide. So death is a cessation of life. It is the ceasing to exist. Under the law, death is not continuing, but occurs at a precise time. In determining, you may consider the following elements among them, the time of complete and irreversible loss of all function of the brain. And the jury came back in, and, and, and in favor of the defendants in this case that they had acted properly and appropriately in determining that uh, the patient, original patient, had just died and taking his organ and transplanting it into the other patient. In a beautifully written editorial, Parent and colleagues, Parent is the author and colleagues, and the team from NYU nicely articulate why NRP remains within the guardrails of a civilized society. First, death they argue, is about permanence. NRP does temporarily restore the circulation, but the outcome remains unquestioned. The restoration is not intended to resuscitate the patient. 
Moreover, NRP is intended to respect the donor's wishes to provide viable hearts, lungs, livers, and kidneys to others so they may benefit. Medical ethics is usually filled with multiple and dynamic voices that are advocating for their agendas. Parent and colleagues rightfully remind us that we all need to consider the donor who cannot advocate for himself at his journey's end. Dr. Shaw concludes with today, NRP offers a way to use hearts that would otherwise be thrown away, respect the donor's last wish, and save lives. What we learn about reanimating and, re and rest, re res resituating, I'm assuming resuscitating hearts in this platform may also provide important insights into how we protect and rescue all hearts from injury. Today, NRP will help increase organs for transplant and ultimately be illuminating key biochemical or genetic recovery pathways may actually help decrease the need for transplant. While challenging our 20th century notions, NRP opens a new 21st century frontier to boldly explore whole organ physiology, our own ideas of death, and an individual's last full measure of devotion. So, with all of that said, that was, that was deep. It's very complicated. It's very, um, I think, for some, ethically challenging. I'm, I'm not sure it is for me. I think that a person who is tethered to a ventilator and has no other means of living will never have another means of living and is going to waste away uh, to nothing and eventually die on that ventilator wants to end that suffering and donate those organs or a patient who may not be completely brain dead but is never going to have any meaningful existence whatsoever um, they may have some 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 brain activity seen on an EEG, but it's they're never gonna be able to communicate, have any thoughts or really do anything other than just lie there. And I understand the, the pain of that family member who's seeing this unravel. And I think it's why we all need to communicate. What are our last wishes? What do we want? so that our family members don't have to make those those very difficult decisions but if you do nothing is that person going to have a miraculous recovery probably not can i say that with absolute certainty of course not what does the data say very unlikely and very low probability but helping others who are also dying from their organ failure, in particular the heart and lungs, can be saved from this. In fact, more than one person. It seems to make sense to me. NRP seems difficult, complex. I've never done it. I've talked to Matt, my friend over in Matt Warhover from Vanderbilt, who works with Dr. Shaw. I've met Dr. Shaw, very, very, very nice person kind soul, um, and nobody wants to kill people for their organs. I think that uh, I disagree entirely with the American College of Physicians, and I completely agree uh, with uh, Vanderbilt and uh, the other institutions, including in the UK and the EU, that are uh, performing this. I think it's very, very uh, needed, very appropriate, and is gonna benefit a lot of patients. So there are my thoughts. I'll see you tomorrow for our simulation, Mastering Differential Hypoxemia. Until tomorrow, have a good day.